I want to talk a little bit about building an effective Sunday, uh, because Sundays have to be, you know, if you look at, if you look at the life of a church, uh, and you study the life of, of the church, and you decide, are they doing a good job? There are three areas that you can tangibly measure the success of a church. The first area is spiritual growth. Are people being discipled? Are they growing spiritually? That's the first area. Second area is numerical growth. Are you adding daily to the church? Healthy things grow. That's just the reality. If it's healthy, it will grow. If it's not healthy, it won't grow. Uh, that's, just, that's just the truth of, of life. Uh, and then the third area is financial growth. Are the tithes and offerings growing? And the tithes and offerings grow as a result of the first two. Well, as a, you know, from a business mindset, and the reality is the kingdom of God needs to be run like a business. Why? Because every time Jesus taught the kingdom of God, he used business illustrations. You know, Jesus, when he said the kingdom of God is like, didn't teach about the synagogue. When he said the kingdom of God is like, he used business illustrations to teach the kingdom of God. And so there is an element of church that has to be run like a business. Now, it's a spirit-led business, and it's a Holy Spirit-infused business, but there are aspects that need to be run like a business for it to work. That's just good stewardship. So if you look at those three areas, spiritual growth, numerical growth, and financial growth, what do we do each week to get the majority of the return and the majority of the profit in those three things? Easy, Sunday morning. That's where we get the majority of those three things. And I know a lot of us, we like to say, well, uh, most of our discipleship happens in small groups. Well, the reality is, you know, they may, you know, uh, uh, that may help, but most of the discipleship happens on Sunday morning through the teaching. You know, because most people in healthy churches only come one day a week. You know, and, and again, this, this can be skewed in small churches that, that aren't, you know, don't have a history of growing, but in healthy churches, most everything occurs on Sunday morning. So how do we build a great Sunday? Because what a lot of churches do is they spend 80% of their time, 80% of their energy, and 80% of their resources into programs that only benefit 20% of the church. You know, that's what most churches do. We're so busy with stuff happening all week long that we have a lot of activity, but it's not productivity. And the reality is life is about stewardship. You know, we're not supposed to be busy. We're supposed to be productive. There's a big difference from activity and productivity. You know, a lot of churches have a lot of busyness. A lot of churches have a lot of activity, but there's whole, not a whole lot of productivity going on. And so we need to be focused in our efforts and focus in what we do. What would happen if churches took 80% of their energy and put it into the one thing that gave them 80% of the results? You know, put 80% of their energy into their 80% Sunday, things would explode. And look at it this way. Everything hinges on Sunday morning. Sunday morning has to be the foundation of the church. If you have 100 people in your church and 40 of them are men, the maximum capacity for your men's ministry is 40. But if you grow the church to 200 and you have 80 men, you've now increased the capacity of your men's ministry. Your outreaches. Outreaches are directly determined by the amount of resources and the amount of volunteers you have available. Well, where do we get resources? Where do we get volunteers? Sunday morning. That's where it comes from, is Sunday morning. Women's ministry is proportionate to Sunday morning. Youth ministry, everything we do is directly, you know, a direct result of our Sunday morning. So if we grow our Sunday, everything else in the church grows. Everything else in the church becomes better if we put our energy into Sunday. And you study the great churches in the world, they put all of their energy into Sunday. And as Sunday grows, everything else grows. Uh, what are the three key areas of Sunday to build a great great Sunday experience, which becomes the foundation of everything else we do. First area is children. You have to put energy into children's ministry. And children's ministry has to be split into two parts. First half of children's ministry is the, the program you do for the child. It's got to be a program that helps people encounter to God. It's got to be a program that helps people focus on God. The second half of children's ministry, and the more important half, is the impression or the perception you create in the mind of the parent. Children's ministry has to be built on a wow factor. And why do I say that? Because parents, when they step into your children's ministry, there's got to be something that makes a parent step back and say, wow, these people love children. These people value children. 
I feel secure about leaving my child here while I go to church. See, most parents will choose a church based on the children's ministry before they choose a church based on the preaching. And if we're going to build healthy, life-giving, you know, powerful churches that are going to reach a community and change people's lives, there's got to be a healthy children's ministry, and people got to trust you with their children. Second area of building a healthy Sunday is what I call production. What is production? Production is everything that happens on the stage. Everything that happens on the stage is your production. The preaching, the worship, uh, uh, you know, the whole stage. And the problem right now is you go to churches, and it's just the worst production you've ever seen. There's no thinking. There's no planning. There's no thought. Look, if MTV can spend months and months and months preparing an award show that doesn't mean anything in somebody's life, how much more time and energy should we put into the most important hour of someone's week, Sunday morning? Thinking through every aspect of Sunday morning, making sure we have a plan, making sure... See, people say, well, I want to be open for the Holy Spirit to lead. Well, the reality is the Holy Spirit can lead you on Monday morning in planning and preparation as easily as He can lead you on Sunday when you don't have a plan. And it actually takes more faith to listen to the Holy Spirit during the week while you're planning and preparing for Sunday than it does to just get up on Sunday without a plan and just hope that he bails you out. Because a lot of times when we live that way, we get into some weird stuff in church and there's a lot of flesh going on and, and we get way off in different directions because we didn't plan. You know, if you don't believe that God is a God of order and preparation, read the book of Leviticus. You know, look at the absolute detail God put them through to prepare his house and temple for worship. We need to have a plan. See, I go to churches and... The worship team will sing a song, and then the worship leader will flip through, find another song, and then start another song. And I sit there thinking, is that the first time they figured out there was going to be two songs? Did they just you know, not know there would be another song coming after this song? Did they not even think out or plan you know, what songs they were going to do? You know, worship teams that don't rehearse the transitions of the songs, you know, where they do one song, then they stop, and then they do another song. You know, and there's no worship experience. It, it, it's, you know, like our worship team rehearses the transitions between the songs more than they rehearse the actual songs so that they can create an experience on Sunday for people, a worship experience to encounter God where it's not, okay, we sing this song, now we stop, now we have two seconds of dead time, now we sing another song, now we stop, where it's just rough. You know, planning out every second, understanding that we don't want to waste one moment of somebody's time. We want to make sure that we have prayed through, we have sought the Holy Spirit, we have prepared for every single second of people's time so that we don't waste one moment of their life when they entrust us by coming to church. We want to make sure that we infill every single moment of our church with the power of God. And if the Holy Spirit shows up and moves differently, you submit, you surrender, you allow Him to. But if He's showing up and changing things every week, then it's probably because you have a problem listening to Him during the week. So it's preparing a great service on Sunday, a great production. And then the most important area of building a Sunday is what I call experience. And what is experience? Experience is everything that happens off of the stage. See, most people decide whether they're coming back to your church before the music ever begins. Most people decide whether they're coming back to your church before the preaching ever get, begins based on the experience they get. Uh, what is, what, what's the experience principle? Well, it's the altar call begins in the parking lot. That's what my pastors taught me for years, Tommy Barnett. The altar call begins in the parking lot. The altar call begins the moment someone steps out of their car, the moment someone steps onto your property. That's when the altar call begins, not at the end of the sermon. See, how they're treated in the parking lot will oftentimes determine whether or not they respond to the message during the service. Do they feel the love of God when they come to your church? What is your church policy for how many times somebody should be greeted before they get to their seat? So you have to have a goal for that. How many times do you want somebody greeted before they ever sit down in your church? You know, most churches don't have a number. Most churches have never even thought about it. And because of it, church has become one of the most unfriendly places in the world today. We don't make people feel up. And we say, well, we're the friendliest church around. Well, it's because everyone knows everyone and everyone likes everyone. But if you're a new person, 
you could walk around the whole time by yourself without anyone talking to you. I have a friend in England, and uh, I've been working with them on the whole doing good principles and serving and loving and reaching your community, and they've gotten very good at it. They have events now with 6,000 people at their church on a Saturday, 6,000 people. The only problem is, in the last 10 years, their church has grown from 900 to 900. They haven't added one person to their church. They'll have 6,000 people on a Saturday, but they're, ain't, they're not adding anybody to their Sunday experience. And, and I was trying to figure out, now they're very good at the outreach, they're very good at serving, they're very good at loving, they're very good at the community work, but why aren't they growing on Sunday? And I discovered it a few months ago. I was preaching at his church, and I hadn't been there in a couple years. And I told him, drop me off down the street, and I'm going to walk to church, and I'm just going to walk up and act like it's my first time there. Not many people will recognize me, and I just want to see what kind of experience I'll get. And, they, and, and they'll tell you at the church, they're the friendliest church in England. They'll tell you that. We are the friendliest church in England. I walked up on Sunday morning, and I walked around the lobby for five minutes before anyone talked to me. Five minutes before anyone talked to me. You know, they were all talking to each other. They were all friendly to each other, but me, you know, who was a visitor or acted like a visitor, no one even talked to me. And I realized right away why the church wasn't growing. They have a terrible experience. You know, they may have a good production, but they've got a bad experience. They don't make people feel loved. They don't make people feel welcome. They're not building on hospitality. They're not, you know, they're not saying, we want everyone to be greeted seven times before they get to their seat. We want everyone to feel like somebody loves them at least seven times before they get to their seat. We want people to feel so good about themselves before the music ever begins that they just want to join our church because of the way we make them feel. See, that's the key. How do you make people feel? What kind of experience are you intentionally and strategically creating to make people feel loved, to make people feel valuable? I visited Joel Osteen's church in America a few years ago, and, you know, they have 38,000 people on Sunday morning that go to their church. 38,000. The building seats 14,000. Let me be real honest. It's the worst church in the world to go to. The building is terrible. I mean, if you've got kids at different ages, you're going to be walking for almost 30 minutes getting the kids to the different classrooms before you even get to the sanctuary. The parking is three blocks away. I mean, it, it, it is the worst place in the world to go to church. So I couldn't figure out, how do they have 38,000 people every weekend? Because it's not his preaching. He's the first to tell you he's not that good of a preacher. And when I went to their church on a Sunday morning, I discovered why they have that many people come back every week. It's the experience they create. When I went to visit his church, I walked in. If you walk into their lobby and you go like that, the people are on you like this. They are on you. You know, they are all over you. And most of you have no idea what I just did. But they don't miss it. They're trained to see it. So you didn't see it, but they're trained to see it. I looked up. If my eyes glance up like that, it tells people nine times out of ten, that's my first time in that building. See, they look. If they see your eyes look up, they're on you. How are you doing? Is this your first time here? We are so glad to have you. Can I do anything? I was greeted 11 times before I got to my seat. 11 times before I got to my seat, they greeted me. They never left me alone one time the entire time I was at that church. There was always somebody walking me around, walking me from one area to the next area, uh, letting me know they loved me, letting me know how much they appreciated me for, for coming to visit. I felt so good about myself, I wanted to quit the ministry and just join their church. That's how good they made me feel about myself. They made me feel loved. They made me feel valuable. They made me feel like a child of God. And I think, what would happen if we began to create that experience in our churches where people felt so loved, people felt so valuable? Uh, another friend of mine in England, they started reaching out into one of the poor housing estates in England and, and really doing a lot of the doing good and the compassion and the dream center type stuff. And they thought, if we begin to reach this area, then we need to fix our Sunday to make sure our Sunday is ready to go. 
We need our music to be more exciting and more lively and more, you know, attractive. We need our preaching. He goes, I want to work on my preaching to begin to communicate in a way that unsaved people understand what I'm talking about, where I'm not using all these religious words, but I'm really communicating. And then we want to work on the hospitality to make people feel loved. Well, the church grew from like 100 to 250 people in just a few months from reaching these housing estates. And they did a survey to find out why the church was growing. Not one person said they came to church because of the music or because of the preaching. Every single person said we came to church because of the way you made us feel. We felt loved when we came to that church. We felt, you know, you made us feel good about ourselves when we came to the church. And so the pastor's ego was hurt a little bit because he's really working on his preaching. And so he asked a few people, well, what do you think about the preaching? And they said, well, pastor, we really don't understand what you're saying anyways. We just feel so good when we come. We keep coming back. See, how do you, what is your goal for the experience? What kind of experience are you intentionally trying to create? I asked Joel Osteen's associate, how did you guys create this experience? Because it's not on accident. This was intentional. You didn't do this accidentally. He told me a story. He was traveling on business, and he was staying at a, at a business class hotel, just a, just, you know, just a regular business class hotel. And he wanted to get a workout in, so he saw the manager at the front desk of the hotel, and he said, excuse me, can you show me where the fitness center is? The manager said, sure, it's down the hall, second door on the left. Uh, Duncan said, thank you. The manager said, no problem. No problem? I'm giving you money to be here. Why would it be your problem? See, there's nothing worse than hearing a Christian say no problem. Every time I hear a Christian say no problem, I want to slap them. I mean, there, there's nothing more stupid than saying the word, Jesus Christ died on a cross. Why would he ever even think about being a problem? A few months later, uh, his associate was staying at a five-star resort, a beautiful hotel resort. Same situation, wants to get a workout, looking for the fitness center. This is a massive resort. It's many buildings spread out. He sees an employee who's, who's busy and he's in a rush. He has a whole stack of stuff in his arms. He goes up to the man. He says, excuse me, I don't want to bother you. Can you just point me in the direction of the fitness center? Found out it was the manager of the hotel, the manager of the hotel. The manager said, absolutely not. I'll walk you there myself put down everything he was working on, walked him to the fitness center, showed him around the resort, gave him his personal number, said, we want to make your experience wonderful. If there's anything we can do, let us know. Well, at the end of it, he said, thank you. And the manager looked at him and said, no, thank you. It's my pleasure. See, that's the Ritz-Carlton. At the Ritz-Carlton, if an employee says no problem, they're going to get a warning. They will get a warning if they say the words no problem. They are required in their policy and procedures to say, it's my pleasure. They're required to. Why? Because they understand something the Bible teaches. The life and death is in the power of the tongue. You can create atmosphere by what you speak into existence. You create culture and you create atmosphere by your words. You can create a no problem church experience or you can create it's my pleasure church experience. See, when you require your leaders to say, it's my pleasure and not no problem, you're creating a different atmosphere. You're creating a different experience for people. You're creating a, a different environment when you require people to say, it's my pleasure. See, there's something powerful about that. And so what they said is we want to intentionally create an experience where people feel loved. We want to intentionally, we want to have a strategy. We're not, you know, a lot of people think, well, people should feel that because we're Christians, because we're Christians and we're nice people. The reality is most of us Christians aren't that nice. We need to be intentional about it. We need to be strategic about it. We need to have a plan for how do we make people feel loved when they walk into our building. See, if people feel loved, they'll put up with bad preaching. If people feel loved, they'll put up with bad music. See, when we started the Dream Center, uh, we didn't have the best preaching or the best music. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a, you know, we had a 20-year-old preacher who, uh, you know, <laughs> it was funny back then when Pastor Matthew first started preaching, you know, he, he would write his sermon out word for word, and he would preach the entire sermon like this. I mean, because he would never take his eyes off his notes. I mean, so, but people came. Why? Because we love them. We serve them. 
We gave our life for them. We made them feel loved in the community, and we made them feel loved in the church. The problem with a lot of churches is they understand how to serve the community, but they don't understand how to apply those same principles on Sunday. And so they get completely out of balance. They do a lot for people during the week. They love people during the week, but they haven't learned how to love them when they come to church on Sunday. To build a great church, you have to learn the doing good side of things out in the community, but you also have to learn the love side of things in the house.